I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a great guest on an essential topic, and we have a lot to talk about. For this week's guest, I need to start all the way back at the beginning of the Future Trends Forum. We have been thinking about teaching and learning with technology since our very, very first session. Every year, we've looked at all the different ways this works, everything from open education resources to digital video and virtual reality. We've looked at criticisms, we've looked at entrepreneurs. Now, this week, we get to introduce someone who is not only interested in teaching well online, but who's been doing it and ran a program for quite some time, and on top of that, writes books about this. Robert Ubell is currently the Vice Dean Emeritus of Online Learning for New York University's Tandon School of Engineering. He's also a senior advisor to New Jersey's Steve Institute of Technology. He's an incredibly smart man who has an awful lot of experience. And I want to bring him up now so that we can talk about what he's learned about how we teach well online. Now, let's see if we can bring him up on stage. And here we go. Hello, Bob. How are you doing? I'm um, really very well. It's uh, <clears throat> a great, excuse me. It's a great honor to be here. And I'm delighted uh, that you invited me and that all of these uh, good folks are out there um, to engage with us. No, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Really grateful to connect you all. Um, now, uh, we, you know, we have this custom on the Future Transform where we ask people to introduce themselves by talking about their personal future. That is what you're going to be working on for the next year. Now, since you're emeritus, and I'm going to guess that you might be relaxing a bit for the next year. I'm not sure. Uh, but besides that hypothetical, what else are you going to be working on in the next year? Any projects, any books? What ideas are top of mind for you? Well, I um, write a column for EdSurge uh, every, about every month. And that's my major activity to, uh, mm -hmm. you know how hard it is to write. You, you write so much, it's amazing. Uh, that uh, how much you put out it, uh, and good stuff too. It's not just out there, it's very well thought out. So uh, okay. uh, you're, uh, you're a model for a lot of us. So uh, it's my column. I, uh, it takes me a much longer to write stuff than you do. Uh, even though I write uh, about monthly, uh, it takes me all month to do it. Uh, I do a lot of research and so on. So. Uh, uh, it's not a, a daily column like some of my colleagues do, which is quite amazing. Uh, and uh, I consult for uh, a Chinese company that, yeah. uh, that provides uh, online learning, uh, American online learning master's degrees in China to mm. make career for Chinese students. And I, um, I, I'm a consultant to uh, Stevens Institute of Technology, and that's that's my life these days, uh, in in sort of semi-retirement. Well, that says a lot, and I really appreciate your columns. Um, and I have to ask, by the way, where are you today? Are you in New York City or New Jersey? I'm in New York, yes. Uh, and uh, I had a, a busy summer. I was in Rome. I was in. Uh, a country house it, that's not mine, but that I rent out on the river. And I've been to uh, the opera, uh, which has been fantastic in uh, Santa, Bar Sa Santa Fe. Oh, wow. It was fat, gorgeous and wonderful. Oh, that sounds terrific and, uh, and well-deserved. And I say that without, no, it's not true. I say that with lots of envy. Um, but, uh, by the way, everybody, um, Bob is very prolific. And uh, on the bottom left of your screen, you should see a kind of mustard colored button that says equality means equality. Uh, and that's uh, one of his most recent pieces, which I think is very important. And I, I'm just wondering if, if I could get you to, to say a couple of words about that one, Bob. Um, how, how does improving the quality of digital instruction lead to improvements in social justice? That's a very good question. Uh, I think it's a fundamental question uh, that uh, higher education, online learning in particular, has to face. 80% um, 
of students who are online work full time. Mm. Uh, that's a very different number, very different percentage from uh, your ordinary higher education student. And in order to work, online is a must. So uh, if we think of online as a, an essential feature for uh, working class people these days, we have to think of it in terms of how to improve uh, the position of uh, poor and working class students because so many of them are online. So our, our focus has to move not only to what we do and uh, arrange and manage for our on-campus students, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, our online students require our attention equally and maybe even more mm -hmm. because they are in need more than our on-campus students. So I mm -hmm. think that's the essential takeaway from uh, uh, the interview that I did in, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, the evolution. So um, uh, I think uh, senior executives at uh, universities, colleges, uh, cannot make uh, online learning an also ran. Online learning has to be as uh, important, as uh, responded to, as uh, resourceful and as resourced as the on-campus student. Otherwise, a whole generation of working class and working professionals who are now online will be not well served. Okay, this is a crucial point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, friends, I have a whole bunch of questions uh, for Bob, but the forum is really for your questions and comments. So I'm going to ask, I think, about one other one just to get things rolling, but the whole place here is for you. Uh, so again, reach down to the bottom of that screen along that white strip and click either the raised hand button if you want to join us on stage or click the question mark. And in fact, we already have one question. Uh, so let me just beam that up for you to see. Uh, this is from, oops, hang on a second. This is from Alexa Pritchard, Alexia Pritchard, who asks, how do you define quality online education? Ah, really good question. I think one of the issues about online learner about anything that's professionally produced. Uh, the word quality is a scary uh, term. It's often thrown at people as a challenge rather than as a help. Hmm. Uh, when you raise the issue of quality, when you know that there are danger points to quality, uh, that uh, you're the, the question often is a negative one to begin with. What about the quality? It's a challenge rather than a help. So uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the question that uh, is raised here, I don't think is in that uh, sphere. Yeah, I don't think there was a challenge in that question, but I think we ought to think about the challenge that's implied when you raise the question of quality. How do you hmm. define quality? Uh, I think that's a question for higher education in general and uh, not uh, to uh, push, us, push online learning aside in a different box. When you're talking about quality uh, at a university, you have to be able to say, our quality online is as good if not better than on campus. So, uh, to go through the list of what it would take uh, to be a quality institution, that's a, another uh, time and place. But I think if we think of online education as a mirror and a uh, partner at the university, not as a separate thing, uh, then the very things that you say are of high quality on campus have to be of high quality online. Okay, so this is not something that we would isolate by itself, but we have to keep it connected. Um, Alexa, Alexia, uh, 
thanks you very much for the, for the great answer. Uh, we have another question coming in too. Um, and this is from uh, Tom Hames. And uh, Tom asks, I find that many online students don't know how to learn very well. What role do you see effective student success courses playing? Shouldn't we teach that before anything else? Very good question. I, uh, I'm not sure whether we should separate the challenge for students to teach well, to, to learn well online. Uh, I think we have to make them a, a, as a, a, a twofer. I think mm. the, the faculty also has to know how to effectively teach online, mm. uh, not just the student to knowing if, how, how to effectively to learn. Mm. Of course, they're both not easy, but let's say uh, that we were not in the present time, where we go online to look at movies, videos, we go online to do our banking, we go online to do every practically everything in our daily life. Online should be just as easy for the student as well as the faculty member to run their online class, to learn in their online class just as easily as you do your banking. Mm. Uh, the, the, the question often is, why aren't we asking the same question about how students learn on campus? Most data from uh, scholars about the effectiveness of teaching face-to-face -face is just as questionable as some of the data that we've had from those who teach online. So um, I'm not going to uh, give you an answer for how one uh, prepares uh, students to, to learn online. I think once you uh, absorb the lessons of teaching online, active learning particip particularly, face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, not so much, of course, uh, but uh, uh, the, the techniques that are used in online uh, are, are equally important uh, for teaching face-to-face. -face. So again, uh, my answer is not to split how one learns effectively online as a student, uh, but one has to broaden that issue on, and say how one learns online if, uh, effective, how one learns effectively on campus as well. Um, lecturing often uh, on campus and online is a mistake especially online, and uh, you will get far more response uh, from your students if you participate as a faculty member in active learning with your students, uh, together with your students, rather than separately. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Tom, thank you for that great question, and Bob, thank you for that very meditative and strategic answer, uh, which covers a lot of ground. Uh, in the chat, there's been a lot of agreement, people saying that, you know, we should uh, not compare online teaching to face-to-face, -to -face, but we should think about them as being part of the same system, uh, just different modalities. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, those two questions that we just had are examples of, well, questions from uh, Alexia and from Tom. If you'd like to uh, follow up with your own questions, just go to the bottom of the screen along that white strip, that question mark button, and type in your questions. And Bob, you know, before I could even say more about that, two more questions just came in. So let me make sure they get a chance to uh, come across your screen. Uh, this is from um, Michael Crawford, who says, to understand doing edu online education well, how important is it that we distinguish between synchronous and asynchronous learning offerings? Another good question. I think the questions have been great. And uh, they're very uh, insightful about the nature of uh, online learning. Uh, this question, I think, has been uh, lately uh, by, by many faculty uh, resolved itself. I think both are, are what's uh, required, uh, the synchronous and the asynchronous. You have to have uh, a teaching style that allows students to go offline and not be constantly in the camera's eye. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the asynchronous activity in which students do research, do 
um, readings, uh, go to the go to the digital library, uh, respond to questions uh, from their colleagues offline in uh, in various ways, videos and, and chats and uh, email and so on. It's just as important as what happens in the video environment, in the synchronous environment. Uh, what we're doing now, uh, the synchronous environment, is only a small fraction of what is possible in a digital world. Uh, this is a very, almost a throwback, uh, this uh, um, technology, to uh, uh, the times when you would be on the radio or on TV. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, this is not a, uh, an advance uh, above what has been normal for years. This is what happens in a classroom. But what you want online is not what happens in a classroom, but what, ha what happens as an engaged learner with your peers, with your faculty. Those are great observations. Um, thank you, Bob. Uh, and uh, Michael, thank you for raising one of the great, great uh, topics in online education. Uh, and we have more questions have come in. Um, and again, if you want to join us on stage, folks, just press the raised hand button. Uh, you can see that Bob and I are pretty nice uh, and we'll be uh, very, very glad to. Uh, you don't know that, offline. So far, so far, you know. Uh, uh, Tina uh, uh, bettler Pagel asks, as colleges prepare for their digital learning future, what questions do they need to ask to ensure that they address gaps they may opportunities and best support student success. Ah, uh, another brilliant question. Because that's, I think, a fundamental question that uh, academic leadership has to address right from the beginning. Yeah. What, what are your responsibilities as a leader? Do you just throw people in Zoom and let it go or other technologies? and let the faculty just do what they do on campus? Or do you have to investigate what it means to teach online? How effectively uh, you have to go past the synchronous experience and do other things that are uh, equally effective and more effective. Engagement is the key. Uh, if uh, you just uh, talk, without your students talking, if as a student, as a faculty member, if you uh, do what uh, is being done here, that's the way to move. You have to engage your students just the way this a group is being engaged. And there are more, even more effective ways of engaging your students than what we're doing today uh, on video. Uh, video is a great uh, miracle thing. Uh, Zoom and other technologies like this are uh, another miracle that has invaded online learning in a very positive way, but it's not the only way. As a matter of fact, it often is a, uh, an interference with doing uh, active learning and having, st having students be engaged in what it is they're doing, what it is they're learning, in uh, being a uh, a partner with you and your students, but also uh, being a investigator mm -hmm. rather than a listener. Mm -hmm. Again, the crucial part of active learning. And that is that is our, our kind of secret agenda here on the forum is to try to model that as, as best we can. Um, these are great questions uh, and, and they're still coming. We have one from our good friend, Lisa Durf, who goes back a few minutes to ask you this question. Isn't the best quality online a combination of the best asynchronous and synchronous elements? Yes. I have a one word answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, uh, faculty have to think about what that means. Uh, the, the synchronous mode is what we're doing essentially now. And, uh, it, uh, it has its benefits, but it also has its drawbacks. And I, uh, I encourage faculty not to rely 
on the synchronous method to the exclusion of the asynchronous method. And to answer that question, uh, you have to think as deeply, perhaps even more deeply, about the ways in which asynchronous learning occurs and how it stimulates your students and how it even stimulates you as a faculty member to think about how to stimulate your students. I think if you just stand up in an asynchronous mode like I'm doing now and yapping away, uh, it, it takes no thought on how uh, best uh, to get the students to be as engaged as you are in your material, to have them become investigators of their, uh, and, and to, to stimulate their interest in the intellectual activities that occur. Talking does not often stimulate other people to do the same thing as you're doing. Uh, other methods are, are required. So while it's true that uh, in answer to your question, yes, uh, both things are, are necessary, uh, but asynchronous is far more creative, far more insightful, and uh, far more engaging than the synchronous learning. Well, that's fascinating. I mean, I, I, I often think that we have a, a problem that multiple generations were raised uh, on television. And uh, so this appeals to them as a, as a comforting um, medium. But, uh, but at the same time, without the digital world, we've always had asynchronous teaching. Uh, this is when you say, okay, go home and read the textbook, right? Uh, or go home and work on this experiment uh, and then report back. Right? I mean, it's um, people write papers, uh, they write reports uh, out of class. Uh, Lisa, great question. Great question. And Bob, thank you. Thank you for that terrific answer. Uh, we have a couple of questions about uh, negativity around uh, higher education and uh, online education in particular. So uh, let's bring up one from uh, Sergio Costa. Uh, and Sergio asks, higher ed faculty worry about a lack of socialization in online. I've never gotten a compelling example of this. I think that's more of a case for K through 12. Is this a concern for you? Yes. I think socialization is critical. And if you don't provide uh, an arena for socialization uh, online, uh, then uh, you're failing your students. Socialization is a key to what goes on on campus, not in the classroom. I think we confuse that. Students don't often socialize in the class. I've sat in classes uh, as a student, as a youngster, mm. and uh, probably 90% of the class, I ne didn't even know their name. I never even spoke to them. So to think of socialization occurring in the classroom, that's a mistaken idea. Mm. The socialization occurs on campus, uh, outside the classroom. Uh, I, often I would sit next to somebody for an entire semester and uh, never even say hello uh, hmm. in a classroom. Uh, so the idea that socialization occurs uh, uh, in a face-to-face -face classroom is just mistaken. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, it occurs on, on campus, of course. So we have to online create an on-campus atmosphere. And that's not easy. Uh, I'm not saying that... Uh, Faculty members have the skill to do that, but it takes a skill uh, to um, to create an environment in which uh, uh, students interact with one another uh, offline uh, is a great advantage to the students. They learn peer to peer, and they also learn uh, maybe to meet uh, their next uh, mm -hmm. uh, roommate, their next. Uh, love mate, um, uh, their next work mate uh, for their future. But uh, to uh, create an atmosphere that is uh, highly social uh, offline uh, is a skill that faculty members have to learn. It's not easy. You have to read about it. You have to talk to people who do it. Uh, you have to make uh, uh, the space for it. Uh, you have to encourage peer-to-peer -peer engagement, uh, which is a critical thing. And you have to encourage uh, students to email them, 
the, each other, to send videos, to do all kinds of things that um, make them uh, care for each other, not just intellectually, but care for each other emotionally. And they need it now, especially. In today's environment, where war is going on uh, in, uh, in Europe, where uh, the climate change is affecting everybody, uh, where um, the uh, illness is affecting all of us, uh, especially our young people. We have to be uh, do peer-to-peer -peer and engaged learning as a positive emotional step uh, away from the misery that so many students find themselves in. Mm. Um, one of the worst numbers lately is the suicide number. Mm -hmm. uh, more students have committed suicide in the last 10 years than ever before. So we have to be very cognizant of the role that faculty online and offline pay, uh, must play in order to uh, make students, our students feel safe. We must have our students feel safe in our in classroom. And that safety can linger outside the classroom into the world. Bob, how can, if I can just quickly put in a question of my own here, how do you think colleges and universities can do that well outside of classes? The setting aside faculty and classes for right now, I mean, is this, is this an area where, for example, residence life can do more online or, you know, depending on the institution, the Greek system or professional societies or the library? I mean, how, how, can a, how can a college or university really just kind of thicken that social network around classes? I think it's a good question. Uh, I think the online world already has models uh, for how people interact. Uh, I have friends online that I never met. Yep. Uh, and uh, some of my uh, most uh, dearest friends now are not. I've never. I've never seen them. Uh, my editor at EdSearch, uh, who is a dear and careful and uh, terrific guy. Uh, I met him once uh, several years ago and haven't met him since. But we see eye to eye on so many things. I turn to him uh, for help in how to write the, uh, the things that I do. Uh, I, I, and so those kinds of interactions nowadays through digital means can be as effective and as meaningful and maybe even more meaningful than the casual uh, hello uh, on the campus. So um, I don't know how to instruct people how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably should learn how to do that, how to tell people how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the off-campus experience is very powerful. And uh, uh, I have, uh, many of you mind also may have these friends who you've uh, learned to get close to by email and sending videos and, and uh, dispatching things to each other. Uh, so uh, yes, I think if, if the uh, university believes that its on-campus role extends into the minds of its students outside of class, then it will play a very, very positive role in the emotional future of our students. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, appreciate um, tackling my question. We, we, we had a couple of responses to this in the chat. A few people recommended social and uh, emotional intelligence. Uh, Christina uh, Setsakam, Christina, I'm trying to get your name, sorry if I, if I mangled it, uh, points out that the cybersecurity world, of all things, actually is really good at socialization. Ah, that's good to know. That's good to know. Uh, and we have more questions coming in. Uh, so clearly, Bob, you you have completely failed to intimidate people into ask, not asking you questions. Um, we have a, a really nice one. It was my aim, yes. I could, I could tell, I could tell. We have another question about the negative side from Marlene Lee Kang who asks, can you talk about the stigmas of online learning and how online education evolved to resolve those stigmas? Ah, oh, very good question. 
Uh, Marlene is uh, one of my closest friends, actually, it turns out, from uh, NYU. And uh, I'm delighted that she's here and that she's asked a question. Uh, she, she was a wonderful uh, colleague at NYU uh, mm -hmm. and is uh, now elsewhere and, and doing marvelous things. Hello, Marlene. Um, so the, the battering that online learning has been given <clears throat> has had a, uh, a serious negative effect uh, on online learning. Um, there was a time when the first question that people asked me, once I told them that I was involved with online learning, they all, everyone said, is it any good? In a kind of a secretive, you know, uh, I know you're in it, but is it any good? Um, uh, and so that, that is it any good question, it comes from uh, the doubt whether online is any good. It's a very peculiar um, situation. Here we are, all of us, uh, whether we're professionals or not, uh, doing online every day, uh, sometimes 10, 15 hours a day, uh, if you look at your phone. Uh, uh, buying theater tickets, uh, go, uh, buying your movie tickets, uh, looking at movies online. Uh, all the, your pleasure also is so much mediated by the media. Uh, uh, and so what happened to online learning? Why does everybody applaud their relationship with the media and with technology and with digital means. Oh, it's so much easier to do this now. Oh, uh, I could never have seen that show without this. Oh my God, I, 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 I read every night on uh, my mm -hmm. uh, digital book. Uh, all these uh, pleasurable things that people experience online. Then along comes online with the same stuff. What's going on here? Why is there so much bashing and trashing of online learning uh, when you don't hear that about uh, watching videos mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, on your screen? I've never been able to understand it. I just know it exists, that there's a vast difference between what people acknowledge what people experience and what people feel about their positive relationships with the media and with uh, digital means and their skittishness and uh, sometimes negativity about online. I know there's a big change and there's a, there's a uh, vast change that happened between um, the uh, COVID-19 mm -hmm. and uh, today. The initial reaction of students was pretty negative. Uh, most surveys had maybe a three or a 9% approval rating of uh, students' experiences online. Yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a new uh, survey uh, has come out uh, students and uh, their wishes for online, and more than 50% uh, want to go online. So what's happened? Wow. Uh, from 9% in the early days of COVID to more than 50% today want to continue to do online. I don't know the answer. I'm just raising the question. Mm -hmm. Now that's fascinating. I mean, so it might be that we have already done things better and uh, and that's taking hold. People recognize that and, and respond. Marlene, what a great question. And Bob, what a what an inspiring answer. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, we have more questions coming in. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance uh, to respond. Um, we have a, a, a call from um, our friend John Hollenbeck, uh, who asks us this. Or request us to do this. Let's quit using the false dichotomy of online versus classroom. Then, what is the learning problem? Who is learning? 
not delivery of teaching. Good. Uh, it's not a question. It's a statement. And I agree with it. Uh, I think um, the dichotomy has to go. Uh, and I uh, am one of the pushers in that direction. Uh, online versus on campus is just uh, gone from my perspective. It, hmm. it has no meaning anymore. Hmm. Uh, uh, it has to be the same, especially since so much of, uh, I mean, 50% of uh, faculty have already taught online, and 50% mm -hmm. of students have learned online. Uh, so uh, we're in that uh, uh, period uh, of uh, online learning taking uh, a, a major share of higher education. And uh, so the whole uh, dichotomy uh, is just wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the people who have to understand it are not you and me. We have no power. The people who have to stand up, understand it and appreciate it and, and absorb that lesson are the presidents and the provosts mm -hmm. and the chairman of departments throughout America. Once they are in the more than 50% category, then the dichotomy will disappear because they will support both modalities equally. So this is one of those changes that just happens year by year, bit by bit, um, and then it becomes recognized. Um, good question. Good or good. Sorry, John, as usual, good comment, good comment. Uh, we have another one from uh, Bancha uh, Srikacha uh, coming to us from uh, Manhattanville College. And uh, Bancha asks us this. We're going to put this up on screen. Now that many faculty have experience with emergency remote teaching from the pandemic, what challenges remain in faculty development for online courses? A great, great question. I recommend that uh, some of the answers to that question be found in my latest book staying online. Uh, it's, uh, the, first, the opening chapter is about uh, the effect of uh, COVID-19 on higher education in the United States and elsewhere. And uh, how the pre presidents and provosts and chairmen didn't do anything wise. They just depended on Zoom and off the faculty went. Mm, mm. They didn't think about, because they, they were all raised in conventional education on campuses, and uh, online is an alien environment for them. And so when uh, COVID-19 came along, very few schools uh, actually thought to train students, to train faculty and students how to go online, how to learn and how to teach. And so they just took what they did uh, on campus, uh, faculty, and uh, put it online without any thought that a new paradigm was necessary. So what needs to be done now is almost the answer, same answer I gave to the previous question. The future lies, the future of online learning as a quality education, as useful to its students, and especially to its working um, professionals, uh, is the notion that online has to be equal to, if not better than, teaching face-to-face. And the presidents and provosts and chairmen must recognize that. If they don't, we're going to go on and on, year after year, having faculty un untrained to do what's a core uh, quality for teaching in the US today, but teaching in the world today. Um, teaching active education engaging students in their own learning uh, with their peers and with the faculty member jointly. It's a, it's a triumvirate uh, 
the student, uh, the faculty member, and the peers. Once those are aligned and, in, and engaged with each other, uh, the rest comes naturally, if you think about it that way. Right. The, uh, the presidents and provosts and chairs don't know this yet, except in you know rare university cases where uh, the uh, faculty and the, uh, the senior faculty and the senior people are engaged. And that's, I would say, maybe 10%, maybe 15 at most uh, in today's universities. Once uh, the uh, transition occurs, when they actually wake up and realize that this is their university, mm -hmm. online is them, not somebody else. I think uh, once you absorb that lesson as a senior person, as a president or a provost, then uh, American higher education will solve the dichotomy. Well, that's a big strategic call. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, do you, um, friends, we, we only have about 13 minutes left and there's a bunch of questions here and they're actually, they're very precise questions, uh, Bob, and I, I want to give you a chance to take a whack at them, but I want to make sure that everybody's question gets to be aired. Uh, our good friend, the very energetic, uh, Glenn McGee, uh, asks this really straightforward question. How should we be measuring successful learning? Huh, very good. It's a fundamental question for higher education, uh, not just for online. Uh, there are measures uh, that I've, I've been thinking about uh, that may have nothing to do with what, what, uh, what is classically important uh, mm. for measures of of learning. I think one of the key numbers is uh, retention. How often do your students in your university go on to finish? How many drop off in their first weeks, first months, first semesters mm -hmm. and don't come back? The more who stay on, the more they're going to learn. The more who stay on, the more they're going to succeed in life. So one of the best measures is retention. Uh, I could mention, measure, mention others, but for me, that's one of the highest. For working class kids, uh, for middle class kids, for poor kids, that's the key to their success. So if you as an institution can uh, provide uh, the kind of support, the kind of love that the institution needs to provide, uh, and uh, consequently retention remains high, 98% of your university graduates, not 50%, you've succeeded. So when, when you said retention, my first thought was that you meant mental retention. <laughs> but you're, but you're specifically referring to institutional retention. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn, that's a, a samurai cut of a question. Really, really good. Very, very good. Uh, by the way, friends in the chat, um, uh, Tanya has been sharing a uh, link to a project that she worked on, um, which is a, a, a framework for uh, trying to understand uh, higher education uh, quality. So it's called the uh, AVID for Higher Ed Framework. Tanya, thank you for sharing that. Um, we have another question uh, which uh, draws on a particular uh, population. And Sergio, I'm very interested in this myself. I can tell you why later. Um, following up on socialization, what are some of the tools that you've used at NYU to create community engagement among students, particularly 100% online, living in different places? Um, it's some of the tools that I, I, I've already mentioned. Uh, okay. uh, some of the most uh, effective ones are um, providing group learning uh, in which uh, uh, 
students are gay. I know students don't like it usually because they get graded. It depends upon how good uh, their uh, their partners are in their group. Um, uh, but you, as a faculty member, you have to uh, solidify that uh, direction and uh, uh, try to make uh, students engage in groups in ways uh, that where they don't feel uh, that their that their grade is going to be um, affected by some uh, jerk uh, who sits next to them in, in their group. Uh, I think. Um, The, the, the active learning participatory mode effect is the most effective uh, when students work together, are engaged together in a group project. And that could be everywhere in the world, and it could be down the block. Uh, there, are, there are other methods as well, but I'll, I'll start with that one. And you can see just by uh, imagining what, what goes on in a group, uh, you, most of you have participated in face-to-face -face groups, uh, and, and you know the success, uh, sometimes failure, uh, when it's not run well. When they're run well, uh, you learn so much about what's in the minds of your colleagues, and you get close to them. Uh, I've, I've participated in groups uh, all my career, in different uh, careers that I've had outside of higher education. Mm. and. Uh, I've gotten close to those people from one or two meetings. Uh, I, I, um, I'm on a, I was on a, uh, a, an advisory group to a publisher. And two or three of the people who I met as, as members of those advisory groups, because we met once a month face to face, uh, uh, I'm, I'm close to. I have lunch with them. Uh, we talk to each other. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing. Uh, once you put people together, they find ways to embrace each other. Mm. Mm. I'm still uh, COVID sensitive enough that that makes me twitch, but um, but uh, in a literal sense. But this is so crucial. I, I, I admire the way you, you've used language of love and caring, Bob. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and a great question. Um, well, one thing you might want to read. Please. It's a, a book I wrote a while ago. It's called uh, Virtual Teamwork. Oh, okay. And uh, it has uh, lots of methods to use to uh, engage your students in, uh, in interesting things uh, and how to grade them uh, fairly as well. So uh, I, I, it's Wiley and uh, it's me, Robert E. Bell. And the, the title is Virtual Teamwork. So Wiley is getting a bump right now. Um, <laughs> people are clicking on this and, and, and grabbing it. Um, uh, we have a, another question from a, a, a kind of similar angle, actually, which has to do with uh, a different population on campus. Uh, large international student enrollments. How do we deal with the international student requirements that must attend in person as part of their visa requirements? Do we educate government officials? And this is Charles Finley at Northeastern. Uh, that's a major bureaucratic question. I don't know uh, how that's going to be accomplished, uh, except schools that uh, recognize the power of online learning internationally, not only domestically, uh, open their doors uh, to international online students. Uh, the company that I'm uh, consulting for in China has done that. Mm. They, uh, they make uh, arrangements with uh, US universities and uh, the Chinese uh, students in uh, Beijing and Shanghai and elsewhere uh, go online uh, and uh, participate in US degrees. Um, so that's one way to overcome the boundary conditions, the actual boundary conditions. Um, I'm, I'm at a loss 
uh, to recommend anything else because I, I'm not uh, wise enough to know much about uh, the rules that are in place for visas. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping, uh, that this is just a hope and not a strategy, that uh, the demand for uh, being on campus uh, may go away. That may be partly the educating uh, government officials that Charles is asking about. Yes, yes. Well, thank you. Uh, that's a that's a good answer. And again, that puts us back in the in the framework of uh, ongoing change. Um, we have uh, time for one more question, uh, and this is from uh, the excellent Michael Haggins, previous guest on the program. And Michael asks, "What observation do you have about traditional institutions acquiring online entities?" versus homegrown? Very good question. I think all of the questions have been just spot on. Uh, there's not been one of those uh, weird questions that you get sometimes uh, when you're on the stage and some somebody asks something from the way out feel when you're, you're, yeah. your, your mouth drops, you have no idea what to say. But every one of these questions have been just right. Uh, on the mark. Uh, this one, uh, I think um, the issue has to do, I'm losing the question. What is it again? Okay, let me bring, let me bring it right back up again. So what observation do you have about traditional institutions acquiring online oh. I guess what you like Purdue buying one. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so far, uh, it hasn't been an unvarnished success. Uh, I think the reason why uh, many of them have faltered or uh, tripped uh, a little, uh, maybe a big, uh, big way. Uh, is because they're two entirely different, usually, two entirely different cultures. Uh, one is the uh, academic culture uh, traditional schools uh, have uh, and have had for centuries. And the other is uh, the online culture in a, in a for-profit world. What they've mm -hmm. done is they've merged online for-profits uh, together with uh, nonprofit uh, or state schools. And um, those two uh, are so culturally different. Mm -hmm. uh, even at the bottom line where they spend their money. Uh, for profits can spend hundreds of millions of dollars on marketing. What higher education academic university would uh, come close to that. That alone uh, separates the two uh, yeah. dramatically from each other. Yeah. So um, I think uh, I'm, I'm not opposed to mergers at all. Uh, I'm not opposed to uh, for profits and, and, uh, and nonprofits or state universities getting together. But um, they can't go on in their new merging uh, environment as they both did before. They have to rethink the alliance from where from where each of them stood before. I don't know what it could be, but they can continue in their pathways that they followed before, because uh, it's a it's a train wreck. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I think that's part of what's going on with the mergers that have already happened. Well, that's good. Uh, that's a good caution. Uh, and Michael, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, the only thing that I'm sad about now is that our time is up. Uh, we have just uh, raced through an hour uh, in a conversation with you, Bob, um, and it's just been an absolute treat. Uh, what? How can people keep up with you and, and your work? Should they follow you on on that search or? Uh, sure. Sorry, no, I, they can go uh, to my website, uh, bobubell.com. Uh, I post uh, all of the things that uh, happen to me uh, or, I, or I happen to it 
<laughs> on my website. So that, that would be great. And if you want to get in touch with me by email, please, um, I'm open and eager to uh, communicate with you. Uh, that's uh, bobubell at gmail.com. Uh, those are the two uh, principal ways. But of course, uh, if you look me up on EdSearch, uh, about once a month, uh, you'll catch me. Uh, this has been fantastic. I I think I felt at ease, and because uh, I'm not always at ease uh, on, on these things, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and comfortable with the, the questions and with your uh, uh, the way in which you run this. I, I was delighted. This the questions were great, uh, and your uh, mediation is powerful. So I. I've had a wonderful time, and I hope others have had a wonderful time too. This has been a very great hour. Oh, th th on, on behalf of myself, thank you very much. And on behalf of everybody else in the forum community, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm, I'm awfully proud of everybody here. And uh, Bob, it's just been a treasure to get a chance to learn from you uh, and your, your extraordinary wealth of, of experience and, and reflection. Thank you so much. Um, please uh, take care and uh, enjoy the uh, the writing, consulting, and opera. It was great. My this pleasure. was wonderful. Bye, but don't, everyone. Don't leave everybody. Uh, let me just point out if you a couple of notes. If you would like to continue talking about these issues, everything from synchronous versus asynchronous to how to measure learning to its cultural change, just go to follow us on Twitter. Use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or tweet Shindig at Shindig Events. Or you can head to my blog, brianalexander.org, where we talk about this stuff all the time. Uh, if you'd like to look back into our previous sessions, if you'd like to look into sessions, for example, on active learning and many on online learning, just go to the archive, tinyurl.com slash FTFarchive. Now, if you want to look at more topics coming up, head to forum.futureofeducation.us, where we've got the upcoming sessions all listed. And if you'd like to share something that you've been doing, um, besides asking brilliant questions, just shoot me a note. I'd be glad to share it with everybody else. In the meantime, thank you all for uh, this past hour, which has been a delight. I uh, hope you're all doing well, especially as the fall semester starts. Please take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.